Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today for our College Education Savings webinar. We're excited to present for you all today. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. We are recording the session and we'll likely be sending it out early next week. So if you wanna watch it again or send it to a friend or colleague, you're able to do that. Uh, second is that although we would love to take your questions, we have a lot to fit into our 40 minutes today, so we will not be taking questions at the end. If something does come up that you're curious about or wondering more about, please do feel free to give us a call or shoot us an email and we're happy to chat. So before we begin, just want to do some quick introductions. My name is Heather Jordan. I'm the Managing Director for TrustPoint's Emerge 360 Division. Been at TrustPoint for a little over five years now, and I am a CFP or Certified Financial Planner, and I do a lot of financial planning for both TrustPoint clients and Emerge 360 clients. And my name is Jennifer Gander. I am also a CFP and a CPA. I work with TrustPoint as a relationship manager, and I work with a lot of individual clients as well as some of our nonprofit clients. So just to give you kind of a brief overview of who TrustPoint and Emerge 360 is, um, and so we are headquartered in La Crosse, Wisconsin. We also have offices in Minneapolis and Eau Claire. We've been around since 1913, so a really long time doing trusts, estates, investments, wealth management, all sorts of different financial topics for people. Uh, we as a company manage $8 billion in our assets, and that's assets across individual accounts, uh, 401k accounts, foundations, nonprofits, all of that totals $8 billion. So I like to say we're big enough to have a lot of different services and departments to help people with different needs, but small enough to be able to provide personalized service and provide these webinars for people to attend and kind of enhance their financial education. We work a lot with trusts and estates. We work with folks in investments and wealth management. So if they want to work with someone in a financial advisor capacity, we have about 200 401k plans that we administer as a company. We work with foundations, nonprofits. We have a family office. And then most recently, we launched Emerge 360 back in 2021. We service all relationships that come to TrustPoint, 50,000 all the way up to a million. So the agenda for today, so we're going to be covering questions to ask yourself as you're starting to think about, should you be saving for education costs? How do you do that? Things like that. We'll be covering the cost of college, ways to pay for college, the top questions that we receive from clients when we do planning and just in meetings in general, and then how to balance college savings with other financial priorities. So we do have a quick video here, which just kind of sums up the cost of education, that it is very high. We're parents, and as parents, we love and want what's best for our kids. Raising a kid in today's society isn't easy. There's all kinds of new dangers that we have to watch out for that our parents didn't. One of the biggest concerns to this generation of kids is the rapidly rising costs of college. According to Forbes, a $10,000 college education in the year 1986 would cost $59,800 in 2015. That's over 2.5 times the inflation rate. The good news is that's not stopping kids from attending college, as more students than ever before are pursuing higher education. The bad news is they're being forced to pay for their tuition with borrowed money. And today's college graduate is striking off into the real world bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and already buried in an average of $35,000 of student loan debt. $35,000 sounds like a lot, but not entirely unmanageable, right? After all, they have their whole career in front of them and plenty of time to pay it back. A recent study by LIMRA found that a college graduate saddled with $35,000 of student loan debt would end up with upwards of $350,000 less in savings when they reach retirement. That extra time spent paying interest on their debt rather than earning it in savings adds up in a big way over the long haul. So we know that saving for college is important, but what's the best way to go about it? Certain financial vehicles have been created specifically for the purpose of saving for college costs, like the popular 529 plan, CSAs, UTMAs, IRAs, education savings bonds. The choices can be overwhelming. It's critical to understand your choices and the advantages and disadvantages for each option. Click here or click the link in the description for an in-depth comparison of... All right, so that just kind of showed the cost of education, that it's going up quite quickly. 
and the impact that taking out student loans or having debt to pay for education can have on your overall retirement plan. Even as someone who is just entering their career as 20 year old, it can have a big impact on your ending account balance once you reach retirement. So a couple questions to ask yourself as you're thinking about this topic and how you and your partner or spouse want to handle how you save for this. So the first question is, do you think your kids will go on to higher education? Some parents know that their kids will not, and so they don't want to save anything just in case their child does not decide to go on to higher education. Some parents think, yep, my child is definitely going to go on to higher education. I would like to save for them. Um, so really have the conversation. It's, it's hard when your kids are little because they don't know yet if they're going to go on to college or higher education. But as they get older, start having that discussion with them when they're 12, 15, getting close to that 18 age, what they think their plans are beyond high school. Second question is, do you have capacity to save? So we'll talk about this a couple times in the presentation, but your priority should be saving for yourself before saving for education costs for someone else. You want to make sure you have a really good budget in place and make sure you're saving for your emergency fund, your retirement savings, making sure you have enough to pay off your debt, so your mortgage, car payments, maybe you have student loans that you're paying on. If you've got all of that covered and you still have capacity to save, saving for education might be a good option. Again, if you think your kids or whoever you'd like to help is gonna go on to higher education. Question three is how much is your goal to contribute? So we get the question all the time, You know, how much is the average that people save for education? Do they pay for all of it? Do they pay for none of it? Do they pay for a certain percentage? We've seen everything across the board. Some clients wanna pay for 100% of their child's education. Some want to pay nothing. They want their kids to save, maybe take out student loans or um, delay going to, on to college to, pay, to try to pay for that. Some clients want to pay a certain percentage. They might say, I want to pay for 25% of my child's education costs, or I want to pay $5,000 per year towards this cost for my child. It's really hard to plan if you don't know how much you yourself want to contribute to that education fund. So one of the first questions you should be asking yourself is, what is your goal to contribute? And then we can work that into your plan to make a plan to get to that ending amount. And then number four, what are your other financial goals? So obviously you wanna retire someday, but do you wanna travel? Do you wanna to gift to charity? Do you wanna buy a second home? All of those things are really important goals for you, whatever they are, and those should be your number one priority. Again, saving for education for someone else should be secondary. They could always take out a student loan, start school later. Maybe they don't go on to higher education, but once you retire and if you don't have enough funds, you may have to alter your goals and your spending habit, or you may have to go back to work and get a part-time job to fund your goals. So those were the initial questions you should be asking yourself. Now is the cost of college, which we usually get quite a few shocked faces when we cover this. But as you probably know, the cost of education is really, really high. And the inflation rate for education is much higher than the general inflation rate. So here we have a chart for a public two-year, public four-year, public four-year out-of-state, and private nonprofit four-year education costs per year. And this breaks out tuition and fees, housing and food, other expenses, and then lists the total. If we just look at the public four-year in-state, the average cost for that per year, $29,000. So a lot higher than I think people estimate it that it is until you have someone who's going on and having to pay these costs. As I mentioned, the inflation rate for education is much, much higher than the general inflation rate. So if you have a newborn or a young child who you think will go on to higher education in 15, 20 years, that $30,000 per year might be closer to 70, 80, or even $90,000 per year. So it's important to be realistic, but know that you don't have to pay for all of it. Um, you can pay for some of it, part of it, none of it, and really make sure that it fits into your plan if that's a priority of yours. So make time your ally, the power of compounding. So a lot of people ask, how much should I save to try to get to this amount? And this is just a basic chart of what that could look like for you. So 
In these four instances, this is when you start with an initial contribution of $2,500 and you make monthly contributions of either $50, $100, $250, $500, $500. And then if you do that for five years, 10 years, 15 years, or 18 years. So you can see the longer you have to invest, the higher your account balance will be. And that's because it's growing, it's invested, the account balance will go up with the market in addition to your contributions. So you can see if you invest $50 a month for 18 years, and this is if you have a 6% rate of return, you would have about $27,000 at the end of that. If you do $50 a month for five years, about $7,000. So try to work this into your budget. Again, the first question to ask yourself is how much do you want to contribute? Have that number in mind as a goal. And then we can see how much are you able to contribute, knowing that you have to have your emergency savings, your stuff, your retirement covered first. So here we have another example of saving for college. So in this example, their assumptions are that the annual cost of college is $50,000 per year. The cost of college increases by 4.5% per year. We have an investment vehicle, whatever that is, earning 6% per year. And the parent or guardian wishes to fully fund the college education costs. We have in the chart years until college, so five years until college, all the way up till 18 years till college, and then whatever the beginning balance is. So if you have a newborn at home, you wanna fully fund their education, using this example, starting at a $0 balance, you would have to have a $1,140 monthly contribution to this account to fully fund their education. You can see that as you get closer to college and if you're starting out a little bit later, so maybe you have a 10 year old at home who isn't gonna go on to education, higher education for eight more years, you'll have to save $2,300 per month if you're starting at zero and you wanna fund their full education costs. So these numbers are really, really high and I think it shocks a lot of people, but again, important to remember that you don't have to fund 100% of it, you don't have to fund any of it, but be realistic about how much education costs and make sure it fits into your plan. So ways to, pay for, ways to pay for college. There are tons of different ways. There's more than are listed on the screen here, but today we're gonna cover 529 plans, financial aid, scholarships, custodial accounts, and state paid, state prepaid college programs. So again, there's a couple more vehicles out there. We'll talk about the pros and cons of each of these accounts and when it makes the most sense um, to choose a specific account. So the first one we'll be covering is financial aid. So our recommendation is that all students should complete the free application for federal student aid, the FAFSA form. This is used to calculate the expected family contribution and to see if you're eligible for any financial, federal financial aid. This is sent to select colleges. And the reason that it's important to fill it out, even if you think you're not eligible for anything, is that you can have need at one school but not another, and you don't necessarily know that. So really important to fill this out again, even if you don't think you're going to get anything, just to see if something could come up. Um, some states and colleges use the information from the FAFSA to determine things like grants, scholarships, loans. So again, really, really important to fill this out, even if you think you're not eligible for that federal student aid. To apply for this, it's pretty easy. You can go to this website listed here. It takes about 30 minutes to apply if you or fill out the form. If you have all of your information, you'll need the parents' information, things like income, assets, savings, things like that, the child's information, you'll complete it and then submit it. Every year this opens October 1st and closes July, June 30th, the, the following year. June 30th is the federal deadline to get this completed, but many states and universities have a deadline that's sooner than that. So I recommend that you complete this as soon as possible um, if you'll be applying and filling out this form. 
A custodial account is another option. So what this is, is assets are placed in an account. The donor, so the person who is donating the funds to this account, appoints a custodian. This custodian can be the person who donated the funds, so a parent, it can be a grandparent, it can be whoever you'd like, has to be an adult, but could be whoever you'd like. This account is has the custodian on place and then that, that minor as the child on the account as well. Once that minor reaches age of majority, so Wisconsin 21, that account becomes theirs and the custodian falls off. So until they're 21, the custodian has full control over that account, but distributions can only be used for things for the benefit of the beneficiary. So it doesn't necessarily have to be used for education, just for something for the benefit of that beneficiary. The couple important things to remember with this is that the funds are not transferable to another beneficiary. So once you put funds into that custodial account for a beneficiary, you can't take them back out. And so I want them for myself has to be used for that beneficiary and you cannot change the beneficiary to another person, sibling, whoever it is, that account, those funds in there are specifically for that beneficiary, that individual. There is something that applies called kitty tax. Um, I won't go into too many details today, but essentially a portion of it, of the income is tax free, a portion is taxed at the child's tax rate, and then a portion could be taxed at the parent's tax rate. So something to consider as well. Um, and then the other big thing is that again, once that child turns age of majority, it becomes their account, the custodian falls off, and then they can use the account for whatever they'd like. So if they want to buy a car or buy a house or go shopping, whatever it is, they have the discretion to pull those funds out for whatever purpose. So if you wanna pick an account that's specifically for education, this is probably not the best option for you. But if you want an account that could be used for education, but also could be used for other purposes, this would be a good option to choose. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jennifer to cover the other account options. Okay, thanks, Heather. Um, so the first one I will cover is prepaid tuition. Um, this is not available in all states. Right now, it's available in about nine states. It used to be 22, but um, different states have dropped their plans as time went on. Uh, the really big benefit of this plan is that you can pay for in-state tuition at today's cost. Uh, so as Heather mentioned, uh, inflation for tuition and college costs is higher than what we would see in um, other areas. So it's a really great way to kind of lock that in and not pay the higher cost. Uh, there are some downsides to that. If the funds are not needed, you usually only receive a return of principal. So that would mean uh, even though there's been some gain in the uh, earnings and the funds that you put in, you usually only get back what you put in. Um, and most states that do have this program also have a residency requirement. Um, and so you usually can only use those funds in that state. So, for example, Florida um, is one of the states that has this prepaid tuition program, but you would have to use the um, funds at a state college in Florida. So if you're not sure where your kid is going to go to school, uh, this might not be the best option for you. And unlike some of the other options that we're going to talk about today, uh, this program can only be used to cover tuition. Uh, so you can't use it for other costs like fees or room and board or some of those other costs that come along with being in college. So we can go on to 529 plans. Uh, this is a plan you probably see a lot of. Um, they're state-sponsored, um, and you are able to make contributions to this plan. Um, you can be a parent, you can be a grandparent, aunt, uncle, pretty much anyone can contribute to the plan, which is um, a really great option. Um, a lot of states offer residents a tax deduction, you don't necessarily have to be in the state to participate in that um, state's program, but usually you would only get the tax deduction if you are a resident of the state in which you're participating. So if you're in Wisconsin, um, you can get a tax deduction if you're participating in Wisconsin's program, but not necessarily if you're using another state. Um, you are able to then contribute to a savings plan that lets you choose how you want it to be invested, um, whether you want to be 
you know, really high in stocks, really high in bonds. It gives you some options. Um, you're usually only able to change those twice a year though. So it is a little bit more limited than uh, just your typical stock portfolio. Um, and the really great thing about this type of plan is as long as the funds are used for qualified education expenses, the distributions are tax-free. So even though you have, you know, you're, you're contributing this plan for your infant and it grows quite a bit as you invest it and it, you know, time passes, as long as you're using it for tuition, books and supplies, equipment, room and board, um, there's a lot there's a lot more leeway here. The distributions are, are tax free. Um, there's you can contribute up to ninety thousand per year. Uh, so the gift tax limit for twenty twenty four is eighteen thousand. So this basically lets you contribute five years worth of um, of contributions. And if you are contributing as a couple and electing gift splitting, that means you can fund up to one hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Um, with no gift tax consequences. Uh, you will need to file a gift tax return if you do uh, choose this option, but that's something you can talk to your tax preparer for. Uh, the one thing I will mention with that is even though you can contribute up to that amount, that doesn't mean that you're going to get that state tax deduction for up to that amount. Each state kind of has their own rules with um, how much you can contribute and still get that tax deduction. Um, another benefit is that there is no phase out for who can participate. So some of, you know, some other tax benefits and other um, programs you might have, you, if you reach a certain income, you're not able to participate anymore, but that is not the case for 529 plans. Um, you are able to change the beneficiary at any time. So let's say you have one child who you, you know, contribute to this plan for and they decide not to go to school or they get a bunch of scholarships and they don't need all the money. Um, you are able to change the beneficiary at any time. Um, usually if you're moving from, you know, one kid to another or, um, you know, a, a different grandchild from a different child, there's um, a lot of flexibility. But if you're making that change to a beneficiary who isn't a close family member, say you, you, know, you don't have anyone left in your family you want to contribute to and you say, oh, I have a close friend, let's give it to their kid. Uh, there could be some potential taxable issues if you decide to do that. Um, and then finally, if there is a 10% penalty and it, it's included in gross income, if you take a distribution and it's not um, used for qualified education expenses. And we'll get into in a couple slides about uh, some different options that have come up in the last few years uh, for how to kind of get around that and use um, some different options. Uh, so I won't go into all of these because we went um, went through some of these in the other slide, uh, but the kind of the some of the tax benefits for this is again you can make these withdrawals tax free as long as they're using um, them for qualified education expenses. You are also able to use up to ten thousand dollars per year per K twelve expenses. Um, again, this this is an option. We don't recommend it to everybody just because um, it's. You know your funding for college expenses, which can be more than um, more more than the K twelve expenses, and you don't want to use everything up for K twelve and then not have them for your um, your undergraduate expenses. Again, you can have a state income tax deduction. There isn't a federal tax deduction for this yet. And then effective this year, the Secure Act two point lets you to, lets you roll over some of these unused funds into a Roth IRA. Now. I'm not going to get too into this because there's still, um, this is very, very new and there's probably going to be some more guidance that comes out as we go along. But as a as an overview, this will let you do up to, roll over up to 35,000 of what's in your 529 plan into a Roth IRA. Um, you can't do it all at once. It's limited to what the Roth contribution is per year, but it is a way that you can um, move some of those unused funds into a um, into a Roth and still benefit from them, even if you no longer need them for education. Um, again, anybody can contribute. Um, each plan kind of has their own platform, but usually you can get like a code or something that would allow you to um, contribute to a grandparent, aunts, uncles, things like that. Um, and then Heather mentioned before with the FAFSA and applying for the FAFSA and how important that is. Um, 
this is considered an asset of the parent on the FAFSA, which does have an impact on financial aid. Um, so just to keep that in mind as well. And then again, you can change the beneficiary at any time for this account. Okay, so next we're just going to go over some top questions we receive. Um, I'll give a kind of a brief answer for them since we did cover a lot of this in some of the other um, other slides. So number one, how do I fund a 529 plan? Um, each state is going to be a little different, but generally if you just Google 529 plans in Wisconsin, in Minnesota, wherever you're located, um, all you need is uh, you go to their website and set up the plan. So you'll need your social security number, your kid's social security number, their birth date, all of that kind of information. But it's usually a pretty easy platform to be able to set up. And then you can decide how you want to contribute to that, whether it's monthly, once a year, or you know, do it for you know birthdays, things like that. Um, our next question is, what do I do if I have money left in a 529 plan? And I think this is a big concern that people have because they don't want to contribute all this money, have it grow, um, and grow tax free for education, and then, you know, your your kid says, "I'm not going to go to college," or um, they get luck they're lucky enough to get scholarships that cover everything, and so you have these funds left in the 529 plan. Uh, so your options are you can transfer it to another beneficiary. Um, you are, and then another big option now is that you can use that money to roll over into a Roth. And you can also let it sit there uh, because you never know if you decide, you know, the, the person who's the beneficiary might decide to go back to school at, at some point um, and you can use the, use the funds at that point. Again, you also can just take the money out, but then you are going to deal with some taxal, taxable income and that 10% penalty. So you wanna be really careful before you um, go ahead and decide to do that. Uh, third question is, what can I use 529 plans for? Again, this is a little bit more flexible. You can use it for tuition, which is a huge thing. Um, you can use it for your textbooks, um, fees, things like that. If you are a half-time, at least a half-time student, you are also able to use that for room and board. Um, then who can contribute to a 529 plan? That can be pretty much anyone, as long as you um, there's someone who has an account and um, is listed as a beneficiary. You can talk to whoever the owner is for that account, and they should be able to figure out how you can uh, get that money in there. Um, we'd say the, the next question is the big one. How much should I save for college education? Uh, like Heather said, this is very, very based on the individual. We see a huge range. Um, but again, there's a lot of things you can consider. You can consider um, how much how, how much do I want to fund for my kid? Is my kid or another family member um, even going to college? As we saw in one of those first slides, the cost can really vary depending on whether you're going to an in-state school, a public school, a private school, whether they're going to some type of community college first and then a full university. So it really, it really varies, but um, we you do want to make sure that you are uh, saving for your own plans and your own retirement as well. Uh, and then finally, which state should I open a 529 plan? I would say the vast majority of people open the 529 plan in the state that you live in. Usually that's the best option for getting any kind of state tax deduction. Um, however, you can pretty much open a 529 plan in any state. Um, you know, you might like the some of the investment options or the fees in one state over another. Uh, so you you really have a lot of flexibility there. So finally, we want to just bring up again about balancing college savings with other financial priorities. Um, we know that this is a really big deal for a lot of people, and a lot of people want to be able to help out their families, help out. Um, with college education and really set their kids up for um, for the future. So we would say that you really want to sit down with your spouse, sit down with your loved ones and really look at what are your priorities. Um, most importantly, you want to make sure that you are saving for your own retirement and your own future. But we understand that um, saving for college is also can be a really important priority. Um, but we want to you want to be able to understand that if you contribute to 
your retirement. That might mean less for the um, saving for college. And then the same goes both ways. So you, it's really important to plan for that. Um, when you think about planning for college, you, you have to know that um, the later you start, the more you might have to save as that uh, chart that Heather showed us um, can show. So the, if you only have a few years to uh, go before you're, um, someone starts college, you're going to have to save more depending on how much you want to contribute. Um, and then we want to say, don't go it alone. There's a lot of resources out there. Um, Emerge, Trust Point, we have a lot of ways that we can help out and um, you know walk you through these different steps of um, how much to save for retirement, how much to save for college. So we'll just kind of leave with this example that um, Jim and Erica Thompson, they're 48 and they want to save for retirement, but they also want to save for their child Emily's college education. Um, they have some savings, but they know that they also have to be strategic with their future contributions. So, and this is something that, you know, your financial advisor can walk through with you. So one goal is that they want to retire at age 67 with $40,000 in annual income from their portfolio, uh, but they also want to provide $80,000 towards Emily's education. In this case, they're looking at covering two years of community college and two years at a state university. Again, that amount's going to change depending on where, um, where you wanna go for, for school. So for the retirement goal, that would be a retired, a required monthly savings of about 2000 and the education goal would be a re required monthly savings of $716, which would mean they that Jim and Erica would need to save about $27.23 a month. Now to be able to, so that, that's total if they want to fully meet both of these goals. However, if Jim and Erica are in the situation where they can only save $2,200 a month. So now they would need to discuss, well, how much do we want to go towards retirement? How much do we want to go towards education? And you, they might have to revisit, well, do we need $40,000 per um, a month or a year in income from the portfolio? Or let's look at some other options for Emily. Maybe we don't need to provide $80,000 to, to her education. Uh, maybe she's going to get some scholarships or um, get some loans, do some other options. So it's a, uh, it's a very big conversation and there's a lot of things that go into it. And uh, it's definitely important to um, look at all your options and ask for help if you need it. So we'll look at some extra resources that we, that we have. Um, Heather can talk about Emerge and then I'll, be back with something about TrustPoint. So hopefully you know by now Emerge 360 can help with some of these conversations and really giving you an overview of account types and directing you towards which option is the best given your goals and what you want to contribute to an account. We again service relationships 50,000 up to a million that come to TrustPoint. So if you're in that bucket and you have questions and want to meet with us, uh, we'd love to chat with you and see how we can help. Um, and TrustPoint offers a lot of the same kinds of services, again, wealth management, trust and estate services. So kind of, um, I guess, past that $1 million bucket for Emerge. Um, and we, we also do financial planning and um, other planning that we can help you out with. All right. And so to get in touch with us, we have the contact information up on the screen here. Um, we're happy to help and go through some of your options and answer any questions that you may have. Um, and we are very happy you were able to join us today. And uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>